who would have thought that back in 2020, we spoke to Shelley Rose for the very first time. And tonight, almost two years later, we get the pleasure of not only talking with mixed media artist Shelley Rhodes again as your 70th Friday feature artist, but releasing her signature online course with Fibre Arts Take Two. It's one of those pinch me moments and I am thrilled to be able to share it with you. There's a level of dedication and sophistication that Shelley brings to her mixed media work and art practice that is hard to describe. It's really humbling to see firsthand the combination of focusing on meticulous details and at the same time having the freedom and playfulness just to create. Shelley loves to travel and has formed an art practice that is flexible, achievable and goes with her everywhere. From her sketchbooks and pages to collecting fragments of otherwise unnoticed objects every chance she gets. Inspired by the environment, Shelley is known for her beautiful layered artwork that combines fabric, paper and stitch with drawings and prints. She works in her home studio in the north of England and is a member of the Textile Study Group and the author of two Batsford books, Sketchbook Explorations and her most recent offering, Fragmentation and Repair. If you're already a fan of Shelley's through her dedicated poster day on Instagram, a lucky student from one of her popular live classes, or have seen her work on exhibition, then I'm sure you'll agree the results are a well-curated, subtle mix of fragmented splendour. As if every tiny detail was effortlessly meant to be there. But is it really that simple? You'll have to take her course to find out. But before you do, this is your opportunity to ask the questions. We headed to the stunning landscapes in Lancashire in the north of England to film and work with Shelley in April of 2022. We are delighted to release her course and offer you an insight into the many facets that make it so special. So don't be shy, ask the questions, share in some filming stories and get an insight into what Shelley is currently working on. It's been an amazing adventure and we really can't wait to share it with you. So you know what? Let's get started. Hello. <laughs> And oh, thanks for the introduction. It was great. Thank you. Oh, I always find the ones about, you know, the people we collaborate with the easiest to write because I feel like I know you yeah. better. <laughs> Pretty well, yeah, that was lovely. Yeah, for better or for worse. <laughs> but it's just been amazing and we've got so many people tuning in live and I'm going to put some names up to say hi. So hi, Sue. Hi, Eva. Hi, Eva. Yeah. Vicky, you've been so patient, I know. <laughs> Hi, Vivian. Hi, Raywin from New Zealand. Madeline, how are you? Hi, so, Madeline. some you know, you've got such a great following, Shelley, all over the world. Noni says hi. Hi, Noni. Yeah, yeah, I know some of the names and I've taught some of these people and others are new, so it's great, yeah. It's fantastic, isn't it? Just all from Switzerland, fantastic. And wow, fantastic. Oh, it's coming. Oh, Carla, hello, Carla. Lovely to see you. I'm getting those closed captions for her getting ready. Hello, Tara. Fantastic. Well, everybody's very excited to hear about your course. And um, I'm super excited to talk about it as well. It just it just feels like this great epic journey that we've been on. But before we start, I mean, we spoke to you back in October 2020 as um yeah, we were just reminiscing on that behind the scenes. You've been busy. You've released books. You've done live workshops. You've filmed a course. You've been travelling. Like, it's been a really, really busy two years. Good, but really busy. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's kept me busy during all those lockdowns, all those um, um, you know, projects and things I've had to do. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Tell me about your book. I've, I've, I'm lucky enough to have a copy here, but um, for those that haven't got it yet, it's, it's amazing. What, what was it like creating this second book? And can you tell us a little bit about it? I'd love to hear. Yeah, well, after my first book, which was really about my, um, how I start projects and my drawing and sketchbook and, you know, um, 
how um, I, I keep workbooks and I order my research and stuff. Batsford, um, it, was, it did well, and Batsford kindly asked me if I had any other ideas to write a second book. And I thought it'd be really nice to write a book um, that was um, based around my textile work and my stitch work a bit more and more my, some of my experimental work. So, um, yeah, and also I kind of wanted to see if I, I could do it again a second time, you know, with the first book. When you do something that's... that's um, yeah, popular, and you think was that a bit of a fluke? Did it? Did I really do that? Could I do it again? <laughs> you know, after you say never again, I did it again, and um, no, it's great because it's like I think the two books complement my practice. So the first book is very much about, um, like I say, sketchbooks and drawing research, and the second book is is a lot more about um, my approach to stitch and how I use those drawings in my stitched work and how I try and combine the two. And something I've been trying to do really all my, um, since I became an, a textile artist, a mixed media artist, how to combine those lovely spontaneous draw marks into a stitched mark, which obviously takes much longer to make a stitched mark. So you often become quite tight with them. Um, and, and that's something I work continuously to try and do. So yeah, so the second book is about that. And um I realised when, I, when, when I, uh, they asked me to write a second book that what I, what I do and what a lot of artists do actually is, is work quite large and then fragment those larger marks and put them back together in some way. And I got very interested in the idea of repairing things, things that were torn, and also linking to the idea of wabi-sabi, which lots of people, again, are interested in and the imperfect. Um, and so that's really what the book's about. And, and really, I always try and um, push my ideas as far as I can. So, you know, um, if I do something and I think, oh, well, that's OK, what could I do to it to make it even better? Or can I alter it in some way? So, yeah, uh, yeah that's, what, that's what's in the second book, yeah. It's fantastic. Well, I mean, Pam says that she absolutely loves it. Thank you, Pam. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it resonated, resonated so much with her. Her eyes leaked a little. <laughs> <laughs> so isn't that lovely that a, you know that you can do that for people that's amazing yeah you did it again so fantastic <laughs> thank you yeah I love it and I love um all the artists as well that you've collaborated with to sort of that, that yeah. go on some of your themes and you know Debbie yeah, they're all, all very generous with the time you know and it was great timing really because it was just as we went into the lockdown that I started approaching artists would, would they help them be collaborating the book and of course a lot of for the lot of them their work had um, suddenly stopped going out to do their teaching and so perhaps they had a bit more time than they would have normally done and uh, they all it was great to do that it, it wasn't just you know, I didn't say to them oh, could you write this? And then we put it in the book. It was definitely a two-way thing and there was lots of back and forth conversations. And yeah. um, I really enjoyed doing that with, with all the artists in the book. It was great. Yeah. yeah, it's a real collaboration. I love that as well, that, you know, and you're going through that creative process together with other creative people. It's I, I always learn so much about myself yeah. and it's amazing yeah. yeah some of the artists I knew really well and others I didn't I just kind of knew the work and it was nice just to you know to get to know them um a bit yeah. more as well yeah that's amazing well is there a third book in you no I won't ask you yet it's too soon, <laughs> it's too soon. <laughs> I should be saying, is there another oh, yes. Never again, again at the moment. <laughs> Never again, again. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, the themes of fragility and repair and the environmental concerns of the coral bleaching have been quite present in your late, like last body of work. Are those yeah. things, you know, you've been quite busy doing things, but as you continue sort of to work behind the scenes, are you, are those themes still continuing through your work? Yeah, through yeah. Um, I'm actually working on a new project at the moment. Um, it's for the Textile Study Group exhibition, our next exhibition, which happens next year. And um, you know, following on from looking at the coral bleaching, I started to look at um, you know, how plastic affects the coral as well. And um, I, I, I made a, a series of work that was linked to looking at uh, museum cases and work um, displayed in museums and how um, you know, if, if we don't protect our environment, we're only going to be going to museums to look at bits of plastic. And I made all, um, I think I might have sent you some images of, uh, oh, that's right, the specimen case and specimen drawer. And, um, and, and a lot of those are actually little plastic fragments made to look a little bit like, um, you know, 
um, natural specimens. And so following on from that, as I was doing my research and looking into plastic and its effects. Yeah, this is part of my new work. Um, I started to read about how plastic becomes entangled around the coral, well, around all marine life. You know, I've seen photographs of turtles um, completely wrapped in plastic and fishing line. So I started gathering lots and lots and lots of plastic from the beaches. And um, I've got this word entangled in my head and mm. um, making a piece that's linked to that, the entanglement. And... Um, it's for the, for the next, this, I said it for this TSG exhibition, and the, the exhibition's called Making 50 because our group's 50 next year, um, it's our 50th anniversary. And so somewhere within your work, all, all members' work, we want 50, and it, you could be doing 50 units, or yeah. the title of your work could have 50 letters in it, or um, it could have taken 50 hours, or anything, you know. So my, my, I'm making these strips from the plastic that are 50 millimetres deep, approximately. And I'd like to, well, I'm either going to work to 50 feet or 50 metres of this stuff. It depends. I mean, 50 metres is an awful lot. I'm not sure I'm going to get that much made. I'm just going to see how it goes. Um, so I'm making, and then I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to display it, but um, it's, a, it's one of those great pieces, which is often how I work, where I can just pick up a little bit at a time and work on it and then, Join, join the pieces. So I do like that idea of working in snatched moments of time when you're busy um, on small units and small things that can then join to make the bigger piece. So, um, yeah, you have to watch this space and um, see how big it grows to, but that's what I've been working on wow. whilst, whilst doing everything else, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. One of the images you sent through, which I absolutely, I absolutely love, was this one here. Is that part of the new series? That was, yeah, that was, I call that one specimen cards. And it was, um, you know, it was about the fragility of, of coral. And I kept it all white because of the bleaching. And it was, it was alluded to when you go to museums and they have a card, um, an index card about, you know, each specimen. And so they were like little card sized pieces. But I, I, I put a lot of plaster into these to put like the, the brittleness and the fragility of the coral and the textures. Um, yeah, so that's what that piece was about. It was linked, yeah. And yeah. those little pieces that look a bit like specimens on them. Yeah, amazing. A bit like your work, you know, it's so generous and full and there's lots of it. Your your online course is a bit the same way, I have to say. <laughs> Myself, I don't know what it is. It's like when I even when I go and teach an in-person course, people who've been on my in-person courses will know, you know, I just too much sometimes. And I say to the people, oh, I've just got one more thing to show, just one more thing. And if I just show you this. And um, so uh, the online course is a bit like that, isn't it? <laughs> really? It really is. It was it was fascinating to, I mean, you can plan, I mean, you know, so everyone knows, I mean, we've been planning it since what, about October, November. 2020 yeah. and you know we can plan all these things in pa on paper and write documents and all the rest of it but then when you get someone in front of the camera or when you show up you, you really don't know what's going to happen and it was just amazing to watch and then it was just oh and I just wanted to show you one more thing and, oh by the way I've got this and oh hang on I've got this and it was just it it was huge and you're just so generous with your ideas and what I love particularly loved was that you not only demonstrate but then you give the ideas, you give the reasoning, you show the process, you demonstrate the technique, and then you show people all these pieces of finished work and how they can take these ideas forward. And then you throw another 100 ideas at them to go and make it their own. It's it's pretty unique. Um, yeah, it's pretty I, I always hope at the end of a course, when it's an in-person course, or um, obviously my, my first big online course, um, that students will take the ideas and... and put their own stamp on it and take it in their own way. And so if I am too prescriptive, it becomes, I don't want them all turning into me. I want them to take their own style of working. And, um, you know, these ideas hopefully will just push their work forward. So um, I think that's why I say you could do this or this or this or this. And so at the end of the, of the workshop or the course, everyone has a different outcome. And I really love that. You know, I love to see the different... Um, the different outcomes from different students who've all got their own experience and bring their own things to, to, to that couple of days that you do a course or whatever. So yeah. um, that's why I teach in that way. I, I you know, 
and 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 at the end at the end when we always lay out our work or you look at work it it is great to see all the different um ways that students have opted to take their work so that's that's why I like to teach in that way yeah definitely and uh, people are agreeing you know it's never enough and it's never too much so <laughs> <laughs> two former students of mine actually yeah <laughs> yeah yes yes and then I'm is Eva one of your students as well do you know Eva I taught Eva in Sweden oh. yeah I had a lovely time when I went over there to teach yeah oh beautiful very lucky she's one of yeah she's one of yeah it's lovely always to see Eva's name pop up so with with the generosity in the course we did decide to split it into two parts do you want to explain a little bit about those two parts and why you sort of decided that and maybe I'm throwing lots of questions at you, but maybe how they relate to your books? Yeah, well, they do relate to the books really because um, the first part is about how I draw and uh, collect and do research and work in workbooks. And um, and then the second part is is more stitch-based. And I just thought, well, actually, that that's what I do. That's my practice. Um that's how I approach work. And so I could have just, we, we discussed it, didn't we, Ange? And I could have just yeah. done a, 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 um, a course around, based around going out, drawing, sketching, mark making, and then coming back to the studio and making something from it, which is pretty much what part one is. But I really wanted to bring in this uh, more experimental, playful approach to stitched work that, um, you know, I try to encourage what you uh, touch on in my second book so I suppose that the online course is really um, part one relates quite closely to the first book and part two relates more to the second book and obviously there's a lot of overlapping because you know it's, it's not a linear process and you can jump back and forth and I, I do explain that in the course that um, you know you might get to module five and think oh I need to go out again now and do module one again because I've now done X, Y, and Z. And, and as I, you know, I want, I want students to kind of get this um, approach to working really rather than we're all going to work our way through this and make something nice at the end. It, it's not really that type of course. It's, um, it's very much one that I hope you can, obviously you probably watch it in one go when, you know, in, in a linear way first but then you might bob back and forth to various modules and think oh I'll, I'll revisit that or I'll, I can now apply that to something else later in the course so yeah, yeah that's what it is so I, um yeah so it's it's those two parts and I think I think you might have done a little video about um the two parts did you I, I don't, you might not have that to hand I don't know <laughs> yes definitely I'm gonna let's play a video I've got a video about um the course and it's where we um you'll be able to see Shelly in action and talking in her studio a little bit more about the two parts so we'll play that now and then we'll come back and then uh, for everyone watching if you do have questions shoot them in the comment section and we'll try and get to them after this when students sign up to this course I want them to have a really playful and experimental approach to the work I really want you to kind of push yourself and um, be willing to take a chance and be willing for things to go wrong. So we decided to um, divide the course into two parts. And the first part uh, I've called field notes. I'm encouraging you to go out into your local area and rather than going out with a, a plain piece of paper or a, a blank sketchbook, we're going, we make some grounds to go out and draw onto. And that really helps you to loosen up and make marks on something that's already there. I want you to gather and collect while you're out on location. And we bring all that back to the studio to then, um, you know, organise, arrange, rework, and to look at for, for our inspiration for the rest of that first um, part of the course. We look particularly at collections and collections as inspirations for work. In this course, beyond the mixed media techniques that I'm going to show, I'm really hoping to show you how um, you know, important it is to organise your research and you know, to have either workbooks or, or somewhere to store your work and so that you can refer back and forth. I talk quite a lot about how different ways to make a mark and really what I'm trying to get you to do is loosen up and not worry 
and uh, we're not trying to make specific drawings, we're really making marks, printed marks and draw marks and different ways to make a mark. And we're working on quite large grounds that we can then know that we can fragment. And then we start to think about fragmenting and reconstruction and repair and reworking. And that's when the things start to become very exciting. And I'll show you how to make a few simple uh, mark making tools. I'll show you some of my favourites. So then in part two, uh, we've called it Making Changes, Transform, Rework, Represent. We start off by looking at traditional stitching in camphor making and Japanese borrow, and we use that as a starting point. We'll start off in a traditional way, but I'll give you lots of ideas that you might take it off in slightly different ways. I really like to fragment my work down into small pieces. So I work large and I make marks and they're energetic and they're gestural and then I can select and edit. And with those little fragments, uh, I've looked at lots of ways and thought about lots of ways of displaying them and presenting them. I often work in series and throughout the course I'll show you lots of examples of series that I've made and I encourage you to work in series so you can work really quite small and build up larger pieces. I've also tried to include um, references to my own artwork so if I've shown a technique um, I then show you how I've worked towards producing a finished piece of artwork. So it's not just something that you do and put in a drawer, it's something that you do that can actually build into a piece of work. I talk um, towards the end of the course about presenting your work and hanging your work and showing your work. So it'll go from the very beginning, from the very first ideas out on location right through to finished uh, work. I can't wait to see the variety of things that people are going to create. It's going to be great to see the progression of students um, and how they, you know, really come out of their shell, I hope, um, and really take on board some of these ideas and push them and try them out. I'm looking forward to this course and I hope if and when you sign up, I'm really excited to meet you. It's going to be really good fun and exciting and I can't wait. Oh, it brings so much, so many memories of, um, of filming and yeah, it's beautiful yeah. to watch. Well done. Well, Sandra, well, I know you and the team at Fibre Arts Take Two, you do such beautiful, uh, puts, uh, great courses together and you take such care over things. And I know when you asked me, you know, I was, I was really flattered because I'd, I'd seen like bits of like, showreels like that of other courses. And um, it's yeah. just like, you know, if you're going to do one, that, that's the one to do. And um, so thank yeah. you for putting it oh. together beautifully. You're welcome. That was our mission from the very um get go when when we first decided that this is what we wanted to do I said if we're going to do this the courses need to be like a piece of art in themselves they can't be filmed on an iPhone they've got to be nice <laughs> so yeah. yeah we just wanted to represent people in well, I couldn't way. believe the amount of equipment that came into my studio when you all turned up like, really <laughs> like hours to set up yeah I know I know look at this photo this is crazy right <laughs> and actually here's a I uh, here's a photo of Gary. This is our UK videographer, Gary, and my husband, Daniel. And this was shot on the first day. And it's always a lot of talk, isn't there, Shelley, of what are we doing? And is this set up right? And we're we doing and it's You know, yeah. day yeah. one is always tech day. Um, yeah. And then whilst we're talking behind the scenes, Shelley, we had a great day with you out on location. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, my goodness. We got to shoot in some of the most amazing. I couldn't believe it. I mean, not only was it the first time we got to sort of leave Melbourne for, you know, quite some time, but to be able to be taken to Falton Knot and some of your most favourite places was just incredible. I mean, look at this photo. This is, so yeah, it just was breathtaking. So, um, yeah. yeah, we do try to capture that. And, you know, we want to share that with people. We want to take people into your life and where you get them to actually see where you draw your um, inspiration from. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, that fault and not, we, we'd visited um, fault and not. It's about 10 minutes from me. And we we'd, we'd used to do a, a certain route up, a certain walk. And then, of course, during lockdown, we were very limited on where we could go. And um, 
just we, we so we were trying to find new routes locally and we just found lots of different routes up up the fault and not and um it's now the, the one of the routes that we found has now become one of our favorite walks and um and so that's where i took you when you came um when you came to film uh that was one of the locations but with this there's, there's lots around isn't it it's, it's beautiful and I'm very lucky and i'm about yeah. 10 15 minutes from the coast and morecambe bay which is another one of my favorite um places to go and draw and sketch so yeah um, we're gonna get back to your art in a, in a minute but i just wanted to there's these i don't know i talk about these magical moments on set you know and in life there's magical moments everywhere and they don't have to be big and grand and on top of a mountain or anything like that but there was a couple that comes to mind when we were working with you, Shelley, and um, one was on that very first day and we were out and we had the drone out and we're like, okay, okay, and if people follow us on Instagram, they would have seen some of the fun highlights that we do behind the scenes. But it literally, we are out on the beach and we were watching this big black cloud come across and we were like, it's coming, it's coming. No, we can just get one more shot. We can just get one more shot. And, and then um, so this happened. There was you can see the big black cloud. Um, and it was probably very wet hail, but I decided that it was snow. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was he yeah, hailstone, wasn't it? Yeah. Anyway, we, we just had to gather up all the equipment, didn't we, and uh, make a dash for it. And we made a dash for it, but that that was certainly um, one of my favourite highlights. And then one night after having a big full day in the studio, because it takes, you know, a good four or five days of intensive work in the studio, we decided let's go for a walk. And we ended up, um, I forget the name of the place that we oh, were. We went to Wharton Crag. Well, yeah. Okay. Wharton Crag. And then, you know, we managed to capture this shot of Shelley sitting, sketching, just doing her thing and it's just absolutely beautiful. So another little magic moment that, um, yeah, just feel very humbled to be able to share with you, Shelley, and then share that sort of moment with everybody. So, yeah, that's gorgeous. So thank you. Thank you for having us. It was just, yeah, a real treat. Yeah. And you get to travel um, or you love to travel as well and you managed to go to Japan to... Um, the Borrow Museum. Can you yeah, tell yeah. us a little bit about that and, you know, how Borrow is um, part of your, I guess, your ethos as an artist? Yes, well, yeah, it was 2018, um, so, you know, well before the pandemic. And um, there, were, there was, and unfortunately it's shut down now, um, a, a museum called the Amuse Museum um, in, in Tokyo and um, a collection of the most fabulous borrow items, um, garments and um, gloves and mittens and um, underwear, I mean everything, cloths, um, for bed cloths and um, it was in, it was upstairs um, and you, you and there was like shops below it, and you're thinking, well, where, what is this museum? And really, not not huge, and um, almost like you were just going up into, um, I don't know, it didn't feel like a museum anyway. And when I got to the museum entrance and paid our fee to go in, and it said, um, you know, please feel free to handle the objects within the museum. And I thought, never ever seen that in a museum before. Yeah. And, um, so in, in we went and um, all, you know, as I say, it was, it's great to be able to hold those borrow items because they're so heavy. And, and for anyone who doesn't know, I'll basically borrow, um, you know, there were utilitarian garments um, that, you know, poor peasant farmers couldn't afford to keep replacing their, their clothing and their um, and so they would patch them and repair them and, and every little bit of cotton was very, very precious and, and so, um, you know, stitches, things were stitched and re-stitched and reworked and um, it was Mr Tanaka um, who um, started to collect these in the, in the 70s and they, they weren't... Um, they weren't revered objects because um, it was it was quite um, you know it's almost like shameful to be so poor that you'd have to patch your your, your clothing, um, but obviously now and um, it's it's become quite a popular thing. And there's some some photographs I took, um, uh, and, and they're just there's something very beautiful. There's, they're fragile, they're falling apart. The cloth is is worn and tattered. And um, I mean, borrow actually means the company is derived from the word meaning tattered rags. Um, and, and some of them are more tattered than others. Um, and, and so this idea of the patching and the piecing and, and using 
fabric that's had a previous life really appealed to me. And I, I've, I've been making um, pieces with that ethos in mind, not trying to particularly copy borrow pieces, but just the idea that you would recycle your clothes and, um, you know, if it, they're tatty and worn and got a hole in so much the better. But obviously lots of our clothes aren't tatty and worn out. So I, I developed a series of ways to make the cloth look tatty and worn um, before I stitch it. Um, and then I can, and I can um, then stitch these little, you know, rough fragments together. But also recently I've been stitching and then making them tatty and worn and look worn out. <laughs> Um, you know, I go into lots of those methods um, in the in my book and in, on the online course because we don't, people tend not to wear their clothes out here. Um, and I know it's becoming very fashionable now, and you know, rightly so, to mend clothes and repair clothes. But it's quite rare that for people to actually wear clothes out before they decide to get rid of them. Um, mm. So, but um, yeah, so that's so yeah, that whole idea. Um, I mean, with with the borrow, I mean, obviously the colours appeal to me as well because there's lots of beautiful indigos and um, yeah. you know, really the, the, the palette of borrow garments is lovely. But that concept and that idea can be used with any colour palette in any way. So I, I like to do that. I like to look at traditional um, ways of working like borrow and camphor making and think, well, yeah, but how could I make this now? you know, not a copy of Borrow and not a copy of Camphor. How could I make it something? Just use those ideas of the repairing and the overstitching and the, the ragged uh, fabric and um, and make a piece of work. So that's, um, yeah, that's how Borrow kind of influences my work. But also the, the Japanese concept of Matenai, where, um, you know, which basically means too good to waste and, and you know, try not to be wasteful. So every last fragment and scrap is kept and used. And, um, you know, I have bags and bags of little scraps left over from things I've made or projects and I keep them. And, um, you know, that, that one little piece might just work on another totally unrelated piece of work. Um, and I like to do that. And, um, you know, even within my, my sketchbook work, I'll do that. If I do a drawing... Um, or even a, a, a small sketch for my daily Instagram posts, and I don't like it. I can just I just tear it up, or chop it up, or rearrange it, or reassemble it. And this might be little fragments left over, but I'll keep all those, and they'll they'll find their way into another piece of work somewhere. Um, yeah, the, that, the piece you're just showing there, those fragments I found. That was that piece is actually called Lockdown Walks, and um, the there was a call out for what um, artists did during lockdown. And um, I, I think a lot of people submitted, you know, paintings and, um, you know, whatever they were doing during lockdown. But for me, what I was doing was I was going out walking as much as I could. I did my daily walk. And I'm, I'm one of those people, and I'm probably most of the people listening to this interview, um, are always looking down, picking things up. And, and so they were the fragments um, I gathered on my... Um, on my walks and I just presented them in a really nice way. And I, I like to take time to, um, to take these little fragments of, of really mundane things, inconsequential things, things that are just rubbish, detritus. And um, if, you, if you present them and mount them and, um, in, in such a way, they, they start to look quite beautiful. There's something that looks quite beautiful about the ordinary thing when it's, um, it's really presented um, in a thoughtful way, I think, yeah. Yeah, that's so beautiful to hear you talk like that and about your work. Thank you, Shelley, for sharing. That was amazing. Oh, when you were talking about people don't wear out their clothes, I just kept thinking about the pile of tracksuit pants that my son has that doesn't have any knees. And <laughs> like, every time I buy him something and he, like the next day there's holes in it, I'm like, what are you so, well, there you go. Uh, just start gathering those up and using them. <laughs> yeah. I might just start, you know, stitching those knees together and making some my own borrow. He'll, yeah. You know. <laughs> um, but certainly, uh, Noni says, too good to waste a thought for a series. So she's really, yeah. her mind's churning. So that's fantastic. Um, really good. So, uh, and Eva, yes, I noticed that when I had a Google before that part of the borrow exhibition is yeah. in Switzerland. 
Yeah, great. If anyone can see it. I think that I think that original collection now is is touring, or part of it is touring and going to different parts. I actually. I'd, I'd had a trip to um, Lisbon in Portugal and I noticed that there was a borough exhibition on and I thought, oh. Um, and it was actually the day we were flying home, but we had to trek back and have a quick hour around it before I had to run off and collect my, go on my flight. Um, and so you do need to look out for it because um, I think that the, the collection, it doesn't have a particular home at the moment. Um, hopefully it will one day, but it seems that it's touring to different places and it's really worth seeing it in in um, in person because you know I, I'm sure that when it tours they're not going to say feel free to touch the exhibit. Well, I think yeah, that yeah. might I think that might have passed us by really now, but um, yeah, yeah um, very very well worth seeing. Yeah, if you get a chance. I was thinking of you um, on our recent trip, and we were staying in Rome, and it was extremely hot. It was, you know, forty-two degrees, and we just had to get out of the city. And we went for a lovely swim in a. I just googled places to swim in Rome, and there was all these swimming pools. And I was like, no, 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 I just need to be in nature. Where's a lake? So we we found yeah. this lake and swimming in this lake and I was like oh what's that under my feet and you know how you're always like I'm a bit like you I pick things up and collect things. <laughs> but literally I didn't realize that at the bottom of this lake was this beautiful little rusty old oh, olive <laughs> oh and absolutely gorgeous look at that wow. I know right I know so keep your feet you know you got to have your throat ready too, shall we? <laughs> right. Oh, well, I never thought I could find things with my feet. That's a new one. But, yeah, I'll do that. I, and I think, actually, I think it's an extra virgin olive oil tin. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I don't speak Italian. Yeah. But. Look how all the metal's worn away. It becomes quite lace-like, doesn't it? It's just beautiful. I know. I know. So, anyway, I thought you'd like that. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just, yeah, just keep your, yeah, keep your eyes um peeled and your feet feet ready to <laughs> feet ready. that's a new one <laughs> exactly now we have a question about color and I was going to ask you about color as well so this is perfect um Jenny said your color palette seems to be predominantly gentle and subtle which I love but do you ever use strong bold colors I, I tend to use um flashes of strong bold colors but not the whole piece being strong and bold. I mean, my, my color palette got really soft and gentle because I was looking at the coral and the bleaching and it went to almost white, whites, creams and greys, because that's what I was looking at. And I, I often take my color palette um, inspiration for it from whatever it's the subject is I'm looking at. So um, I did make a series of work a number of years ago. Um, I was looking at corrugated iron shacks that had been painted and all the paint was peeling off. Mm. Um, that was a much stronger colour palette. I think I did give you one of those um, images, and but you probably might not have it to hand, but it was a much stronger colour palette. Uh, yeah, that's the one. So that was part of a series um, based on um, these old falling down corrugated iron shacks. Um, mm. And there was, I think, about six or eight in that series. And... Um, and so the colour palette really reflects what I'm looking at quite often. Uh, and so because I've been doing the coral bleaching, um, and that was a fabric book that you shown there that was inspired by, they're my old garments that had us clear out during lockdown. And, I, and obviously inspired by the borrow, and I decided just to make a little book. And there's a flash of the red there, you see, yeah. one of my favourite skirts that did actually wear out. Um, and so, yeah, the colour is led by... Um, often by a collection of things that I'm working from. Um, and it could be that, you know, the colour's quite subtle, but you've just got this flash of shocking pink or um, bright neon orange or, you know, when I've been looking at my um, the plastics, there's quite a lot of brightly coloured uh, colours in the plastics that I use. And so the, pieces, the piece I'm currently working on, again, is mainly whites, because of, I'm trying to reflect the damage to the coral reefs, but there are these flashes of really strong colour in there as well. So it's really considered the colour. I'm not just saying, oh, well, I like these soft colours, um, so that's what I'm going to use. You know, each piece will be um, will be considered and the colour selected. And I do I do touch on that in the in our online course. You know, um, selecting a colour palette from the collection that you're working from and. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I tend not to do exercises on the colour wheel with students. I tend to just think, well, actually, if you look at that, if you've selected that collection of objects, you're drawn to it for some reason. And quite often part of it is the colours or the marks or the textures, but it's often the colours. And so that that's a, a really good way to select a colour palette. Yeah. And it's funny that you say that because, I mean, you know, I mean, I was attracted to this because it's a piece of rusty old metal and I have quite a lot of that around my house. But I was thinking, oh, do I hang it up on the wall behind me? And mm. as I lifted it up behind me, it just matched everything that was in this yeah. room. And it really, like, this was literally only before we went live. I was like, oh, do I hang it up? Or, and I was like, oh, wow, it actually matches everything that's in here. But I didn't really maybe consciously think of that at the time when I. No. I think you're drawn to certain things, you're drawn to certain colours, aren't you? And and it, co it comes quite naturally to people. And I often teach and people say, um, students will say to me, oh, I always use pinks and blues, I always use soir de bar. And, and I could probably say the same, I often use soft greys and whites and creams. But I try not to get into the habit of thinking, well, that's just easy to do that because um, that's what I know works. But to try and you can sh uh, subtly shift your colour palettes um, and still have palettes that you enjoy. And that, that's quite good fun to do as well. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you about colour because when I was putting sort of, you know, your website together and things like that, and obviously when we were working together, you know, you did use this this colour palette that you extracted from some samples and some fragments that you collected during the first few days. And I'll just look up a couple of the images that, that you do create. These are some of the samples that uh, Shelley was working on during the course and you've got this beautiful sort of, yellowy sandy color mustard you know contrasted with the blues and the grays was just beautiful and then you know you can still see those sort of blues and grays coming through there which is the rust and really rework like working those samples up <clears throat> in module seven when you get really quite experimental and these are the gorgeous little walk cards which you know that color palette first sort of originated from um but even the rusty objects and just yeah, they just look so beautiful. It really does look like a series of work. It looks like it's come from the same artist, from the same person. Yes, because because you start, you've got that starting point, that initial starting point, and you consider colour. I always try and get students to consider the colour palette from the very beginning of a project. Um, and it can change as you move along, but if you've got some ideas and you actually you know, make a little mood board or a page in a workbook and, and actually mark those colours down and extract the colours from the collection that you've got. Because when, you, when you've got an item in front of you, you might think, oh, well, well, that's grey. But when you look closely, it could be a bluey grey or a greeny grey or it could be a little bit of cream in there. And, you know, when you very look very closely at objects, there's all kinds of colours that you might not initially see. And, and for me, extracting those colours is a really, really fun part. And, um, and I find that when I teach in live workshops, um, the palette of colours that students come up with, um, because they've really started to look at the, um, their initial inspiration, you know, it, it just, it, just the, it makes the whole body, that whole body of work, uh, work as a whole because the colour, it's linked by the colours. So, uh, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, an approach I take with my yeah. work. I loved that how you use you you know you linked the colours and then you also go through this beautiful um, throughout the course, but um, how you talk about working in a series and like working in rotation, and then you give lots of beautiful examples of that. That was one of my highlights personally as well. So. Yeah, because you work on things and it, and it's, it can be quite linear, but then you think, oh, actually. That was a great idea and I didn't follow that through so I'm going to jump back to that and that's why I always have a workbook and I encourage students to have that and it's that I use the word workbook rather than sketchbook because it's more than a sketchbook it's where you keep all your ideas and mm. test samples and tryouts and tests and research and um, you know in fact with, with my coral series I, I, I think we talked last time we spoke about the hundred pieces that I did linked to the coral bleaching I'm not sure you might not have that image again now oh you've got some of them there um, and when I was working on that one of my very first little initial jottings it was like a tiny little diagram was of um, pieces of plastic in display boxes like in a museum but mm. I, I on this piece and it took me about a year and it was only later that I jumped back and thought actually I never never saw that through and I'd quite like to 
And so then I can jump back to that and, and follow that idea through. And, and that way, you know, you, you never kind of run out of ideas because all your ideas that are in your head are out, you get them out into your workbook, even if it's just a little scribble on a post-it pad that's then stapled in or whatever it is. Um, once it's out of your head and written down or made a little diagram, it's there. And at any point you can refer back to it. And so I really do that all the time. And I'm not always good at having my big workbook to hand. So I'll, I will scribble on bits of paper and stuff, but I'll try and either stick them in or glue them in, or there's a big pile of them at the back of the workbook. Um, and, you know, and, and in fact, when I teach, when I do my teaching and, and come up with new courses and uh, workshops, I, I, I have a book for, for workshops. And every time I think of an idea, Oh, I could show students that. Again, I, I jot it down because it's all very well having all these ideas in your head, but when it comes down to it, you want them there out, out of your head and onto the paper. So, um, yeah, mm. I do a lot of always writing things down and jotting things and making notes. Yeah, yeah, making, yeah, getting it out of your head and making sure that it's there. Exactly, because the thought is just so fleeting, isn't it? It's hard to always grab yeah. it, especially as you get older. <laughs> Yes, that's right. And, you know, then the idea of wear and tear and borrow and mending, you know, I started a workbook on that maybe 20 years ago. And and then I've got onto like the coral. I did quite a lot on landscapes, but I'll, I'll jump back and forth to those books. And um, mm. I mean, I think when I finish this this next piece of work on the, on the plastics and the oceans, I'm, I'd like to go and explore a little bit more of some of the things that we did in the course that we've just done and that idea of, you know, doing something to a piece of work and then doing something again and then tearing it up and rejoining it and, you know, really pushing things. So um, I'm going to go back to that a little bit more, I think, but who knows, you know, and it's time I finish this 50 metre piece of plastic <laughs> that I'm stitching into. Um, I don't know, I might have changed my mind again, but it's having, you've always got the next idea to work on because, you know, you're making notes all the time and thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Never enough time to see everything through. Yeah, it's fascinating because you know, you know, we always talk about what we've been doing and things like that around the home. And my daughter's very artistic, and you know, she's like, Oh, what do I do, mum? And da, da, da. I said, Well, get yourself some sketchbooks and put like a theme in them, start putting your work in sketchbooks and start putting your ideas in. She goes, well, what sort of sketchbooks? I said, just anything, you know. And so she started, she's literally started one on colour theory because she loves colour theory. Um, and she's been researching notes on it and doing colour things. And then she's got another one, I think, on watercolour. Um, but she's got a, like a series of this. So this is just since, you know, April. It's only really just really blossomed in the last yeah. month. But um. I was like, well, you need to start developing your ideas because she'd love to study fine arts at school. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think, I think um, I'm like that. You know, I have more than one book on the go and I have my daily yeah. sketchbook, which I do something in every day. And then I have, yeah. you know, have just coral drawings and I have a just a tiny little notebook that goes around with me everywhere in case I just want to write something down and um, the workbooks. And so you can have multiple books. And, and, and when, when you said, oh, get any sketchbook, I mean, I think that's really, um, I, I remember once I bought a really beautiful um, a sketchbook with lovely watercolour paper and all. It just felt so precious and heavy. And it was almost a bit too intimidating to start working in, you know, because it felt, felt like I had to have a finished piece on that, on that beautiful page yeah. um, so I, I use work um, books that I've got the cartridge paper in them so they're not fancy and they're not heavy and um, you know I, I feel like I can just work on them without worrying too much um, that it's a precious mm. thing um, so yeah just get yeah get started is what I'd say and, and make notes and 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 even just keeping things that you find in magazines you can tear them out put them in and um, yeah idea yeah I love this image of your uh sketchbook a day um yeah. absolutely amazing you could probably do 50 meters of those by now shall you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um you've been how long have you been doing your uh a piece a day or post a day on Instagram yeah, well, I've been posting on Instagram I think I think I'm in my fourth year I did it before. I've done it in the past and but you know just did it privately um yeah. but I think I'm into my fourth year of doing that now um, yeah. yeah, and I've realised with Instagram, you know, you're on this square format. So I had had used lots of different types of 
sketch books previously, long thin ones, and but I've just I just do the square now. I just um, every day it's like a square format, and I just do it. And you know, however busy I'm, and I've been really busy lately. You know, I, I just I find that five or ten minutes to put something together, and you know, it might just be I'm not painting or drawing every day. I might just find, go to my bag of scraps and you know put a little collage together, or it could be just something that. Um, a fan that I want to photograph and you know so it's just it's making you however busy you are in your day find five or ten minutes I mean I tend to spend about half an hour to maybe to an hour even sometimes and half an hour maybe on mine but you know you could if you've only got 10 minutes and you've got 10 minutes and spend that but I do think that daily habit of doing something um doing things in little small small pieces. I think we spoke about that last time with stitching, stitching every day. It grows, mm. things grow, don't they? And um, Yes, and before you know it, you've got this beautiful, long, gorgeous piece and it yeah. just, yeah, it didn't feel too overwhelming. So just start at 10 yeah. minutes. Everyone's got 10 minutes and if you don't, then you're in trouble. <laughs> 10 minutes earlier. <laughs> yeah, get up 10 minutes earlier. Exactly. Um, Madeline loves your post today. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Vicky uses old books, Destined for Landfill, fantastic. Yeah, good idea. Um, yeah, Fiona Reinhardt, yeah, loves a day. Yeah, your Instagram a day. So fantastic. Oops, sorry. Um, Shelley, you had a background as a graphic designer and you weren't really destined for art. You were, you know, maybe sort of more leaning towards the sciences to get, you know, be seen more academic. I'm just wondering, you know, how your... <clears throat> excuse me, background as a graphic designer has influenced your work and how you work now? Because you're very free and loose, but then things come back in. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, um, there's something that graphic designer in me wants to order things. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it is. And I, I realised that actually what I like doing, one of the things best parts for me is I'm, I like to arrange things I just like moving things around and seeing what goes with what and arranging things and so I try to be very loose and free with my initial marks which I like to work and I say I work large and I don't work massive I'm not like I mean I'm talking a3 is quite large for me but you know I always say to students work at a size you're comfortable with so I work large and then I can chop down and then arrange all the bits and I think that the idea of the arrangement is um, comes from my days as a graphic designer. And, you know, we'd have to line everything up and uh, things would have to be straight. And, um, you know, the, the images on the pieces can be as messy and free and loose as you want. But I do like the idea of ordering. And I do it in my workbooks as well because that's me. And I love it when I see someone's workbook that's really messy and it's this bits here and there's bits there. But I can't help myself. There's something... <laughs> And I said that to you with, you know, we've been working on the resource guides lately and I just can't help myself that everything has to be lined up and right and straight. And, um, but, you know, and, and everyone brings their own thing to, to, the, to the work practice, to the workbooks, to the sketchbooks. Um, but it's definitely there, that graphic designer in me um, for mm -hmm. lining things up and arranging and, and how much space is between each thing. I spend a long time on that. Because space is as important as the actual um, pieces or calm areas within a piece. And I always remember at, when I was at art college studying for graphic design, to be a designer, and the tutor said, don't be afraid of space. And that was that, that little phrase has stuck with me. And, you know, sometimes you need to have really quiet areas or space around things just to allow things to breathe and, and be... Um, you know, I sometimes do, do a, a little drawing for my sketch a day and I'm in a rush and I do it and I think, oh, that's really, I don't like that. I can't put that out, but I've got to put it out because I've got no more time to do something else. But sometimes I just, you know, just fragmenting it and rearranging it or cutting it into little square blocks and having some space around each piece, it, it isolates them and, and it, the, suddenly it works and so I do like that idea from that, really. I've, I've realised that whatever you do, whatever marks you make on a piece of paper or cloth, whatever, if you don't like it, it can be used. I'm sure it can be used. Uh, it can be reworked. Things can be added. Things can be taken away. Things can be chopped out and rearranged. Um, and, and I just love that. I love that about this mixed media work. 
Um, because I, before I got into, I mean, I worked as a graphic designer, but then I, when I did my teacher training um, course, I got into working with clay a lot and ceramics. Yes. And, um, and I actually worked, I actually, you know, I got killed and I started getting some work in galleries. Um, but I got so frustrated when I'd spend so long on a, on a piece of work and then it would crack in the kiln or the glaze would run and blob or something would happen. And I couldn't rescue it. I couldn't do anything to it. That, that, that just had to go. Yeah. And, and so when I got into working with textiles and mixed media, um, when I got into working with textiles and mixed media, I realised that actually everything can be reworked and, and um, everything can be, you know... Um, you can add to, you can take away, all those things we've just said. And, and I love it. I love it for that reason. Um, and so gradually I stopped doing the clay work and um, and just started to do my textiles. But I do occasionally, and I do on the course actually, I still have that interest in clay and um, I do bring it into my work, um, which we do on, in the online course, don't we, to a degree, yeah. actually. Yes. yes. So... <laughs> It was like you read my mind because my next question was one of the coding methods is about, you know, the clay slip. And you know, I was um, really fascinated to learn that you were, um, yeah, that you love, you had that love of ceramics. And Yeah, I did a city and guilds in um, ceramics as soon as I finished my teacher training. And I learned all the basics of, you know, coiling and slab work and throwing and glazing, slip. Yeah. Um, and so I have all that knowledge. Um and so, yeah, I started to just, um, well, in fact, when I did my City and Guilds in um, creative embroidery for my 3D piece, I think I might have talked about this last time, I actually made some little vessels that I dipped into porcelain slip and then I fired them and all the papers burnt off and mm. I had these beautiful, fragile, delicate vessels. Um, but lately I've been coating surfaces with clay and slip and cracking it because it does remind me of the brittle coral and uh, the fragility of, of, the, of the coral and, and so the fragile material of the cracked clay. And uh, I, I, I've been playing with that a bit and I, I do introduce that in my course. And it's not, a, it's not something everyone has to do. I just, it's one of those things I'm, sure I'm giving lots of options for students. And, um, you know, yeah. some, some of the things students will go, well, actually, I don't want to put all that over my work. Or, you know, but it's like that whole thing of, if you don't try something and be brave, then you, you're never going to have that wow moment. Where you go, oh, that just works. That's it. That works. So you've got to really, um, well, I do. I like to push things because I, I never get bored then. I never get complacent. I never think, oh, well, I can just churn one of those out. I'm always looking for the, the you know, a new way of working or a, a new way of just um, pushing my ideas forward. Yeah. Yeah. My end. Um, you described it to me once as saying that, you know, this course would really suit someone who's ready to indulge in that interplay of intention and chance. And I just thought, wow, that's that's a beautiful way of putting it. Yeah, because you can, you can um, I like the idea of, you know, I want something to look like this so I can do X, Y and Z to get there. But if I, if I do something where I don't, I, I have no control over it, yeah. the chance chance things start to happen, you know. So you know, if if you were to wrap something in in a piece of rusty metal, you don't know exactly where those marks are going to form on the on the cloth. And um, you know, I know a lot of people have done rust dyeing and, and things on plain cloth. But if you actually wrap your piece of work you, that you've invested a number of hours stitching and constructing, and then you you wrap it in the rusty metal, really that the chance marks you you you've got no control over that. And so um, it's it's quite a different thing to to um, make marks on fabric and then put it together or to put your fabric together and then let something happen to it. And I, I did this quite a lot in the book with, um, I did a lot of washing, repeated washing and, and burying and burning and, you know, all these things that you might lose a little bit of control over. Um, I like that. And some things will work and some won't, but actually the things that don't work, then you can say to yourself, well, what can I do to make this better? What can I do to make this work? And so, 
for me, those pieces are often more exciting because um, you have to do something else to them. You have to push it again and again and again until you get it to work. And uh, I really like that way of working. So that's 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 what, how I've been working lately and how, what we do on the course as well. Oh, I just love it. And I love that you can bring order through your design and your grids from the chaos of that intention and interplay of chance, really. I, I just, I think that it just works so well because otherwise you could end up in this big muddled mess, like, you know, a lot of people, but then, you know, myself included, you know, I just think, oh, what am I doing? But then to be able to then fragment it, bring it back, put it into some kind of order, and then you have art. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah and it, it kind of clears everything. And like I say, I quite like things that look quite clean and fresh and not too busy and muddled. And so, you can do that. You can do that afterwards, any, well, at any point. Yeah, yeah. So. definitely. Francie's certainly looking forward to um, some slip over some work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Francie, great. Yeah, it's really good. Um, Lynn signed up. She said, um, yeah, too excited not to. And, yeah, yeah, can flip back and forth might be, yeah, exactly, ideas from both. Yes, definitely. When we were putting the resource guides together, Shelley, I was almost thinking, like, you could almost say, you know, refer to paid goods on the book or refer to paid. It's almost like this is like the manual for the, um, the course. Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, I don't want people to feel they have to go and buy the book, but um, it's yeah. interesting because I taught a, a live and workshop a couple of weekends ago yeah. and um, we were doing a lot of things that were in the book and I'd taken some work to show them and um, a lot of the students said to me, oh, it's just... Now I've seen it, now I've been with you and seen it, it makes the book even more, I understand it even more now. Yeah. And um, and I think that whole thing of, that, that everything complements each other and they can't be separate. You don't have time to do everything separate. So the book works with the course, works with the way I teach, works with my work, um, you know, because that's, that's it, that's the, my approach to work. So they all work together really, I think. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's, yeah, I loved how it collaborate. It, yeah, they just fit beautifully together. Um, Jocelyn said the program of the workshop is just exciting. Yeah, Shelley's whole creative <laughs> process is actually. So she signed up with enthusiasm. Oh, That's thank amazing. You. Thank you so much. Lynn says, Ange, when do you anticipate the course will start? Well, enrolments are open now, Lynn. Um, so we usually open them for a couple of weeks, but I'm pretty sure Shelley's yours. We'll probably sell out a bit quicker. So if you're thinking about it or you have questions, just email us at support at Fibre Arts Take Two and we can um, help you out making that decision. But if you're still doing Lorna's course, um, maybe stick with that, Lynn, because um, we will open Shelley's again uh, hopefully next year. Um, so if you want to just concentrate. It's always that thing, isn't it? You know, if you've got yeah. your head done, it's hard to... But they do complement each other beautifully, you know. There's a lot, I think there's probably a lot of overlap between mine and Lorna's work. You know, there's tools, there's mark making, there's working, fragmenting. There's going to be a lot of overlap. Um, well, between yeah. lots of artists, really. But um, And the other thing about the, the, the course, my course, is it's not... I don't think it's something you're going to just do and finish in six or eight weeks. I think it's something that some of these processes, because they, they take time to work, you can yeah. still be working on maybe, you know, 12 months down the line. You're still going to be, uh, well, I, I would envisage, you know, you can still dip in and out. So, yeah, yeah. there's no rush to do anything, really. Yeah, exactly. Because sort of the only sort of time sensitive part of it is, I mean, obviously the enrolments. We do try to limit the enrolments to, you know, a, 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 you know, an, an easy number. Not easy, but um, a well, manageable. Manage, I want manage. to respond to as many people as I can and, and help people out in the online course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if you can't do it now, there will be another opportunity. Um, next year um, and Carol um, how do you sign up we'll pop a link just in the comment section now for you so you'll have a link but just jump onto our website and you'll see all the details there under find a course Shelly it's been amazing we've been going for over an hour and I could probably talk to you for um, another hour um, does the course have lifetime access once you join absolutely Heather because it's probably going to take you a lifetime to do it <laughs> Um, and get through all the ideas and sample and play again and rework. It's just, it really is a resource, um, Shelley. It, it, it's amazing. 
Um, well, I'm just really excited about all the different outcomes and, you know, working with students from all over the world. It's going to be great to see what, where they go and what they do and what fragments they can find to use as inspiration. Uh, I'm really excited about it. I think I feel like I've done all the hard work and this is the really nice <laughs> bit coming up now. It is. You get to enjoy it as well. Yeah. Like, you, sure. yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm going to play um, your beautiful uh, showreel of the course and the, uh, you know, it's like, it's like the highlight of putting it all together and all this hard work, um, which collections, I'm just making sure we haven't missed any questions. Um, okay, would collections other than items from nature work as a theme to use for inspiration? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, urban environment, urban walks are great and, you know, actually going out to draw in an urban environment or, you know, like a boatyard or something would be great. Um, you know, it doesn't, it, it certainly, I mean, I've, I've walked in, in nature because that's on my doorstep, but if you live in a city... Um, it would be really great to see your responses, um, you know, through through an urban environment or if you live near woods, or, you know, where, wherever you live, it, you know, you, I'm sure you'll find things and um, as a source of inspiration. It'd be really exciting to see all the differences, actually, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, take the principles and do it, yeah, from anything, yeah. Exactly. I'm going to play the show reel, then we'll say a quick goodbye, Shelley, and then um, play our. Um, so, if people start saying their thank yous for such an amazing hour, an hour of power, really, with Shelley Rose, we should call it. You've, I think, um, you know, whether people have your books or they buy your course, you've just given so much value, certainly in this conversation and then also in our very first conversation as well. So, um, we'll pop some links up to your website, your Instagram for people to follow along. And if people are in England uh, and can take a live workshop with you, then hallelujah, lucky them. Um, it's If you get the chance, guys, just jump in and do it. It's amazing. So I'm going to play this show reel and um, enjoy it. The tiniest fragments that are left over sometimes are really beautiful. There's something quite precious and fragile about them. Lots of people are drawn to imperfections. You know, I certainly am. It's the idea of, of using pre-used things and reusing them and giving them a new life. I love to get out into nature. My art really is a reflection of what's around me and how I respond to that. I really like the words respond, rework and repair because that's pretty much what I do. I'm either responding to the environment or a collection of things that I've found and then reworking and fragmenting and tearing things up. And then of course you have to put them back together. So for me that's where the repair comes in and I have to think, you know, how can I put these separate little fragments together? If I didn't exhibit and I didn't show my work, I still would create. I create for me and I just, I just love to do it. So I've been creating for, you know, 35 years. But when I was starting out and I wanted to learn new techniques, well, I'd, I'd, you know, book onto a course. Sometimes they were a long way away and it was a long way to travel and it, so it was quite a, quite a challenge. I think if I'd have taken a course like this just as I was starting, it would have really um, helped me to realise that, you know, ideas have to be really worked on, you have to push ideas. Anything that I do, I'm always trying to think, how can I put my own twist on it? How can I make it mine? It's a course that I wish I could have taken when I was starting out. There's a lot of content, but there's a lot of flexibility. This is not a standalone course. You must do it in a very regular way. You'll learn that anything can be cut out, moved, reinserted or rearranged. But remember, you have this course for life and some of these things are going to take weeks, well months really, or even years to do or to get through. And so you can refer back to it at any time and, and just take your time and enjoy it. I mean this course really is aimed at all abilities because um, if you're new there's some interesting exercises that can help you through. If you're experienced in some areas bring the experience that you've got to the course and I'm hoping that this will just push your work on, push you to develop and think in a slightly different way. What I'm going to do is throw a whole lot of ideas at you. I do printing, I do drawing, I do mark making, I make tools, I stitch, I coat things, I try and be experimental. And also how to combine fabric and paper. So the drawings linked to the stitched work. 
And I think I've tried to bring all of those things to this course. And then other things as well that I really want you to explore and experiment with. I think there's going to be some really different outcomes. I hope so anyway. I really like the idea of the freedom. How far can you push the media? Uh, how many layers can you work with? What materials can you work with? How far can you go with it? Embrace this idea of mixed media in its fullest sense. And I'm sure that way you're going to produce some beautiful work. Gorgeous, Shelley. Absolutely beautiful. Can't wait. Can't wait to see what everybody does. Thank you for your time. Oh, thanks, Ange. Thanks for the interview and the workshop and the uh, putting all that course together so beautifully. It's it's been great working. Oh, our pleasure. Hang on the line and I'll say one last goodbye. We're going to play the showreel now of our showreel of everybody and put all the gorgeous comments from everybody that's watched tonight. So thanks, everybody, for joining in. And, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. So thanks again. Bye. Bye.